I made the music for a video that showcased 101 different animations by 101 different artists. The music had to constantly evolve and grow for 9 minutes straight, and I had to write, record, mix and master it all from scratch. I had two weeks. This is a breakdown of how I did it, and along the way I'll offer some tips on scoring for video. So this was one of the most unique and challenging projects I've ever done, but also one of the most rewarding. My friend Clinton Jones, also known as Ponisher, is an incredible 3D digital artist who's built an amazing online community. His art challenges draw thousands of entries and each time he creates a montage of the top 100, and this time he asked me to score the music for it. The theme was going to be travel, and the score had to be the glue holding together a hundred very different animations. Unfortunately, I was going to be out of town that month, and so in the end, it was my fault, but I only had a little over two weeks to do the whole thing. So, I knew I had to work smart and efficiently. Planning. First off, I met with Clint to discuss the overall direction. And here's the first tip. When meeting with a director, avoid speaking to each other in musical terminology or abstract descriptions, or you're guaranteed to have misunderstandings. Instead, it's best to find actual pieces of music, listen to them together, and discuss specifics. That way you can have tangible reference points like, I like what the synth is doing here, or the drums need to have this kind of energy. In our case, Clint referenced tracks by Boards of Canada, Mute Math, and Flowex, among others. And so I took detailed notes and made a Spotify playlist of those tracks that I could refer back to. This helped me understand the tone he wanted. It needed to convey the feeling that this art should be taken seriously, but at the same time feel inspiring and fun. Tip number two, draft a handful of musical sketches to present to the director to further hone the direction. That weekend, I made five short rough demos. I made sure that some adhered closely to what we discussed, but I also wrote a few that were more outside of the box. Clint checked them out and told me which parts worked and which didn't. He liked the drum beat from Sketch 1, but he preferred the slower moving chord progression from Sketch 5. And his reasoning made a lot of sense. The longer harmonic 8 bar progression of Sketch 5 had more momentum, like the chords kept pulling you forward. So I drafted up another rough, literally just grabbed the drum tracks from Sketch 1 and slapped on the synth and guitar from 5. And after a little more feedback and revisions, it was time to actually start composing the whole thing. It was important to Clint that the music constantly evolve and build, pulling the viewer forward as each clip went by. That meant I couldn't take the easy way out and just make a bunch of loops. So using the original idea as a jumping off point, I came up with different variations and moods that I could use sort of as landmarks. For instance, there'd be a city pop section. energetic bridge section. A lo-fi hip-hop section. Then it was a matter of developing them and connecting them so that they'd flow nicely into each other. Throughout the whole time, I was thinking about what instruments would create the sonic palette. I decided the most important elements would be a classic drum breakbeat, a thick vintage synth, orchestrated woodwinds, and vocals. Of course, I'd also have some kind of bass and my usual electric guitar. Drums. The main drum sound inspiration came from a couple of tracks that Clint referenced. These drums had a classic hip hop breakbeat sound, and luckily, I spent a lot of years playing in a band called Breakestra that reproduces this sound almost exactly. So I knew what to do. I put together a kit with my Vintage Rogers 20 inch kick for that classic punchy 1960s sound, 12 and 14 inch toms tuned slightly higher and partially muted with cloth, and my Superphonic snare from the 60s tuned high and minimally muted to let those overtones ring through. Synths. The synth you hear most in this track was my one expensive synth, the OB6 but I also used an assortment of soft synths. This leads to tip number three. If you're using hardware synths, be sure to record MIDI takes alongside your audio. That way, if you need to make revisions, 
it's easy to go back and adjust the MIDI, and then just send it back out to control your synth and re-record. Some of Clint's reference tracks had clarinet, and I'm a sucker for beautiful woodwind arrangements. Luckily, my friend Francis Francis is a master of woodwinds, including the ones that I wanted for this song. I wanted an ensemble consisting of soprano sax on top, clarinets filling out the middle voices, and a bass clarinet on the bottom. I arranged the parts in MIDI and made charts for him to play using a free app called MuseScore. He has his own recording setup, so we did the whole thing remotely. Vocals. This was going to be tricky, because I did not want the vocals to distract away from the animations. And I didn't want the lyrics to inject another layer of meaning that the artist didn't intend. At first, I was just going to sing nonsense syllables. But then it dawned on me. Maybe I could sing in a language the majority of viewers aren't fluent in. My good friend Yohei is an amazing singer-songwriter who's fluent in both English and Japanese. He grew up in Tokyo, but honed his songwriting chops in West Virginia, Nashville, and LA. He'd be the perfect person. So I sent him ideas around the theme of travel, plus some melody lines, and he sent me back lyrics in Japanese. Then it was a matter of choosing and arranging them, putting them to melody, and learning how to sing them. At the same time, I had just gotten obsessed with a Japanese band from the 90s called Fishmans. That's right, not Fishmen, but Fishmans. They were like dub reggae meets post rock, and their singer had a really high male vocal range, giving it this otherworldly vibe. You should definitely check them out. That became my main inspiration for the vocal sound. Pretty dumb decision considering my limited vocal range, but I really felt like that would be the right vibe, so I decided to challenge myself. On top of regular singing, I wanted to have sections of abstract chopped up vocals, almost like ambient textures. I ended up recording a vocal chant, chopping it up, creating a contact instrument, and assigning syllables to individual MIDI notes. I performed it rhythmically, like a producer triggering pads on an MPC. Guitar and bass. I took the easy way out here. I was running out of time, so I just went with the demo MIDI bass and recorded DI guitar and slapped on an amp simulation. Normally, I'd play real instruments through real amps, but in the end, it worked out. The dumbed down MIDI bass part was actually perfect for supporting all these complicated arrangements without it getting too cluttered. I made it into this cool mini Moog synth bass part using Model 72 by Softube. And the Amp Room plugin, also by Softube, sounded almost indistinguishable from a real amp and it saved a ton of time. This is a good example of tip number four, which is when working on a deadline, determine the things that will matter most and take as many shortcuts with everything else. As I continued to compose this piece, Clint offered me some really helpful feedback. This leads into tip number five, maybe the single most important one. Throughout the whole process, do not let yourself get emotionally attached to anything you present to your director. If you're writing for your own project, that's fine. But in scoring, if you get emotionally attached to your ideas, you're just gonna keep getting bummed out with every single change and ultimately, you'll bring bad vibes to the whole project. So you have to stay light-footed and be prepared to go in a new direction at any time. For instance, in the first version I presented to Clint, the final climactic section originally had this wildly syncopated acoustic drumming that I really liked, but Clint pointed out that not many of the animations could match this chaotic energy, and he was totally right. It would have sounded way out of place. I realized I had been trying to build intensity by writing denser harmonies or playing busier, louder drums, but there was an aspect I hadn't considered, melody. Clint pointed out that I could start with a simple melody and develop it in such a way that increased the emotional intensity. So I scrapped the complex drums and made a beat that had a lot more open space. And that allowed me to focus on melodic development instead. So not only did this work out better, it actually ended up being one of my favorite parts of the song. Takeaways. I learned so much from this project. Writing music that steadily slowly builds over nine minutes taught me that there's a lot of different ways to build intensity in music. There's the obvious ones like loudness, tempo, and timbre. Then there's harmony, like gradually increasing the complexity of chords, even venturing outside of the key. And now I realize there's also melodic development taking a simple melody and expanding on it, allowing it to become more and more evocative and emotional. 
So thanks so much for watching this far. You can watch the whole montage on Clint's channel, and the song is now streaming everywhere. I'll be putting links to everything in the description. And please subscribe to my channel for more music, recording breakdowns, and my own animations. Thanks.